It won't take a long time, but your uh, speaker tonight is Dr. Keith Scott Mumby from England. Uh, he's the man with the photographic memory, a walking encyclopedia. Man has written seven books, and his latest book called Diet Wise, it represents 30 years of clinical work compiled in a book. He's the number one, named the number one allergy detective in England. With that, let's give a hand, put our hands together and welcome Dr. Keith Scott. Thank you, Dr. Mumby. Thank you, Dr. Mumby. Right, good evening, folks. Good evening. Uh, how, how many of you have seen the movie The English Patient, or you read the book The English? Okay, I'm the English doctor. Uh, I heard before I came here you guys could be a little bit tough on your speakers, but I must say this has been exceptionally friendly, you know, like having a party and the music being serenaded. Anyway, apparently you don't do this for every speaker. I'm really kind of interested. <laughs> I've just got something to say, actually, about the serendipity of serendipity, uh, the serendipity choir. I, uh, before I came to California, I've been here three years now, but before I came to California, I was living and working in Sri Lanka. That's the little island off India. It used to be called Ceylon, and the Brits had it. And it's had various names, Taprabhan, uh, but one of its names was Serendib. That's what the Arabs used to call it. And from the, from the, the country, the little tiny island of what's now Sri Lanka, we got our word, serendipity, for a place of you know, happy circumstance and chance. And having lived there for two years, I can tell you it's, it's very like that. I mean, Arthur C. Clarke lives there by choice. I mean, he's seriously rich. He could live anywhere he wanted. But he's actually lived pretty well all his life since the 50s in, in uh, Sri Lanka because it's lovely. It is a little jewel. There is a theory that it may be the origin of the uh, King Solomon's Mines story because I, it is famous for gems, but I can tell you on good authority, I have seen it, <laughs> that when it rains heavily in the mud runs, there are gemstones come out of the ground. I mean, it's that, that kind of place. So maybe it did give rise to the King Solomon Mines stories, who knows. Anyway, it's very ironic that I should be booked tonight. We've got about five days to go to Christmas, and I'm here to tell you food is bad news. <laughs> this is the one time of year when you don't want to know. <laughs> So it's a bit unfortunate. I'm glad you had all your cookies and stuff before this talk, because you, you wouldn't be able to swallow them afterwards, I promise you. Now, I've got two examples that are adventitious, unforeseen examples of exactly what I'm going to talk about. My lovely lady wife, Vivian, was meant to be here. I love her very much, and I like her company when I'm speaking. She's at home in, in bed nursing a horrible headache, which she got by eating a food accidentally. And I mean accidentally, you know, it was just hidden in something she ate last night. I gave her a stinking headache, so much so that she had to actually lie down. So the food can certainly do that, but it can do more. And then finally, one example I want to share with you because it's important to me. Uh, I've almost lost my voice. It's down to about 50% volume because of something I've eaten in the last 24 hours. It could be the least of ice cream I had last night. <laughs> because I happen, to, <laughs> I happen to know I'm allergic to dairy, so it's a very stupid thing to do. But it's a Scott Mumby rule that I have, you know, that what you do wrong now and again isn't a big deal, right? It's what you do wrong every day that really destroys your health. And that's something we'll look at. Anyway, if you can see from the title, I chose a provocative title. I know you like scientific titles here, but I thought this is provocative enough, you know, that food can not only hurt you, it can really, really hurt you. And I'm going to start by sharing a few stories from over the years. And the first one I want to share is this one, which is probably the most moving story of my career. This is a 39-year-old lady, uh, Susan on the left, that's her mom on the right. Susan McQuinney was 39 years old when she woke up. She said one day, I just woke up and realized I was there. How did this come about? Well, she was diagnosed as uh, brain defective, uh, you know, mentally and functionally subnormal. And she was, certainly was in a bad way. She couldn't add up, she couldn't read or write, she couldn't add up money. She wasn't even safe in the kitchen. She would burn herself and had to be supervised. Couldn't cross a road safely. She didn't really understand what was happening around her. <clears throat> and uh, it's a pretty bad state to be in, really. But nobody had ever bothered or ever minded much. You know, it's, well, she's brain damaged, what do you expect? And nobody did expect anything, except me. <laughs> and I thought, well, I wonder what happens if we change her diet. You see, I have a theory about brain function that, you know, we can lose brain function for physical reasons, that's for sure. But then it can be made worse by some temporary or 
interruptible process, like in an inflammatory process, and particularly food, as we'll see. Anyway, to cut a long story short, it turned out to be true in her case. She was very allergic to wheat, I got her off wheat. Three weeks later, she suddenly woke up at 39 years old to realize her life had begun. Can you imagine that? I mean, that's pretty awesome. She, had, she was a, a cause celebrity, you know, she was a magazine and a media. It was quite a story back in the 80s. And, uh, oh, here's a couple of more quotes for her. She said she'd like serving a long, harsh sentence in prison. This was an, a, a magazine article from a German magazine called Bella, although it was obviously the English copy of it. Um, I just quoted some of her words here. I think her own words are quite moving, so why don't you just spend a minute reading what she had to say about this, especially this fourth paragraph, you know, she, she had the senses supposedly, but it was all such a jumble to her, she explained afterwards, that she couldn't really work out her perceptions and what they were trying to tell her. A, a tragic state to be in, it's a story with a happy ending, but I think she'd be jolly entitled to be really, really mad that it took somebody 39 years to find out what the problem was. But that's how bad it can be. Now I've got another case in this genre, which I don't have a picture for. Um, my first wife, bless her, threw out most of my <laughs> media clippings and videos and things. <laughs> uh, even though it said in big red letters, Keith's files, do not, <laughs> do not erase, you over-recorded it with Simpsons or something. Um, anyway, this, this is a, a similar story. This is a girl with uh, cerebral palsy, no, you know, spastic is the, the common word. You know, like this, you've seen this condition, okay? And there's no question, I'm not trying to say she didn't have cerebral palsy, okay, she did. But it was the assumption that because she'd been brain damaged, you know, usually damage at birth that causes this, that there was nobody home, you know, the lights were off and nobody bothered. But again, she got brought to me by a very inquiring mother who'd heard the stories and sort of seen the media work I was doing, and said, do you think it could be relevant to Angela? And I said, what well, I usually say, which is, I don't know, <laughs> I have no idea, let's try it if you like. So we did. Same story, a girl at 18 years old, never spoken, was just sat in the chair like this all day. You know what the first words that she spoke in her life? The very first thing she said was, I love you, mummy. She didn't have to learn to speak. That was the amazing part. She, she knew language, she'd understood language all along for 18 years. She had learned language, but couldn't express it. And all it was was a couple of foods that were aggravating brain function to the point where she couldn't, she, she couldn't extrovert and couldn't express herself. But she was home, and within a few weeks she was asking to be taken to the movies. And again, that became a big newspaper story. So that's what we call a brain allergy. Or we call brain allergy in those days. I'm going to uh, slightly modify the, the term allergy as we go through this. That you'll see that. Uh, but just a few more stories. This is, I'm sorry, this is a bad clipping. <clears throat> it's just badly copied, that's all. A young fellow called Jason. This is another similar story. This is brain malfunction. But in this case, it was a young teenage boy that used to get into violent rages. He got himself in trouble when he, he decked a teacher. <laughs> Thumped him so hard, the teacher was knocked unconscious. Big trouble. Well, they'd seen, again, they'd seen my stories and brought him in to see if that could be relevant. Indeed, it was. And the, the picture is a kind of newspaper's idea of a joke. He was allergic to wheat, bread. He was eating about a loaf and a half of bread a day. That's something that we'll be visiting. People who are made ill by foods very often binge the foods, and they, do, they can't stop. They want to eat it, and it makes them really bad, and in his case, it made him violent. Because of this story, I've got another story. Uh, okay, I'll come to the other story later. They're out of sequence. But this is a lady who was, uh, she could hardly walk. She was in a wheelchair. Her husband was faced with giving up work to look after her. And it was the silliest thing you can imagine. She was allergic to potato. That was all. She gave up eating potatoes, complete recovery, all her joints, improved on x-ray by the way, we had all that documented, and she finally had a, a picture taken for the newspapers on top of a mountain. Not only she managed to climb the mountain from a wheelchair, but she was first up. She beat all the photographers to the top apparently. I wasn't there. <laughs> Another kind of story, this is a girl who had anorexia. Um, and to cut a long story short, that was a food, it was wheat. She didn't really have anorexia. It only looked like anorexia. She'd eat, eat and eat, and she was binging wheat until she felt so sick she couldn't face food and wouldn't eat for weeks or months. So she turned into a skeleton hardly. And then tried again, and it made her sick, so she gave up food for more months and so on. It made her look like an anorexia case. 
but she wasn't at all. When she found out what the problem of food was and stopped eating it, she ballooned out. You can't really see that clearly, but she's skinny as a rake on the left, and then she's a nice filled out uh, lady on the right. So it's amazing what variety of conditions can fall under the purview of what I'm talking about tonight. Here's a wild and wacky one. A girl used to get drunk when she drank orange juice. What, what do we mean by that? Well, you know, it, alcohol on the brain is basically a poisoning effect. The reason it makes you drunk is it poisons the inhibitions first, that's all. So you're uninhibited, you get wild, you get on the table and sing. That's exactly what this girl did drinking vodka and orange, and they all thought it was the vodka. <laughs> so she drank orange juice and was worse than ever. Anyway, <laughs> when we finally found out it was orange, I didn't say, drink the vodka, that's fine, but don't have the vodka with orange. <laughs> this was the other violent story, you know, Jason with the loaves of bread. Uh, the father of this boy uh, saw, the, uh, saw the story and said, could this be of any relevance to my son, or stepson, in fact, he was. My stepson is currently facing a charge of attempted murder. He tried to strangle his stepfather. And to cut a long story short, that became a major medical breakthrough. I made medical legal history in 1987 when the British Crown Court in Ballymena, that's Northern Ireland, accepted my scientific evidence that food allergy could make this youth violent. We actually uh, challenged him with small inoculations of... Uh, it, there were th four things that he was allergic to. The, the most uh, important of which was potato. The newspapers got hold of the fact there was an Irish boy allergic to potato. <laughs> <laughs> they had a field day, but I'm serious. Now, he was made killer mad uh, on occasion when he ate potato. You might, I mean, you might say, well, he ate potato all his life. How come he became a you know, murderous later? That's another part of the story, which I hope you'll understand by the end of the evening. Anyway, the, to cut a long story short, he was, uh, he was given a conditional dis discharge. He wasn't sent to prison. The, the condition being that he stick to the Scott Mumby diet. And uh, I found out years later that the judge had actually, there was a, a long TV program, I had about 45 minutes on prime time TV, it'd be like sort of CNN news here, big story. And it turned out the judge had watched the, <laughs> watched the TV show. So it was, uh, it was a foregone conclusion he was going to get off. This is it from Ireland. Uh, um, I became pretty successful, I ended with clinics everywhere at one stage, including having a wild time in Ireland, city of Dublin, wonderful people. Hell City, you have so much fun there. <laughs> but this child came through that clinic. It was a result of uh, Gay Burns, radio show Gay Burns, is a sort of Larry King. And uh, we went on air with this story and again bombarded with people in this kind of predicament, many of whom did respond. But this particular child was outstanding. This is a four-year-old child and if I and talk about ADD or hyperactive, we used to say in those days, if I tell you that truly, not metaphorically, truly, they had to nail the furniture down. This four-year-old child ripped a door off its hinges. He was capable of such extremes of activity. Again, just a couple of foods, I think, wheat and dairy. I can't remember what they were, actually, after this many years. Um, but, you know, a, a child in that, I mean, what, his life was... Uh, he developed a condition called disintegrative psychosis. That's a kind of extreme version of the autism-like spectrum where the person just goes backwards and backwards. To cut a long story short, he had a happy finish. He ended up with normal schooling. I mean, he was way in the lower strata, but at least he was in a normal school strata where he'd been faced being sent to a special school because he was uneducatable. This is the most embarrassing headline that we ever had. <laughs> I don't know what your traditions are here, you probably don't remember what a milkman is. <laughs> but in Britain, the milkman usually comes to the front door and delivers the milk. And he often does it when the husband's already gone to work. So there's quite a lot of mythology about milkmen. <laughs> anyway, this is a lady who was infertile, and it turned out to be milk allergy. And she consented, very nice lady, consented to the story because she thought it would help others, you know, know that their infertility might be curable, it might be just a food allergy or food intolerance. Anyway, some smart, smart ass sub editor put this title to it, which I've got to admit is very funny. <laughs> but she got plenty mad, it cost us a lot of boxes of chocolates and flowers to calm her down, I can tell you. Uh, but a very, very witty headline. But still, the point is, is an important one, you know, even infertility. So I'm trying to make this point before we go on that foods can hurt you, really hurt you but in all kinds of surprising ways that people won't necessarily think of. 
This story came out in the late 80s somewhere as a result of having a drink with an Irish journalist in a bar in Dublin. I said, uh, immortal words, if only I could have got my hands on Marilyn Monroe, she wouldn't have died. <laughs> I was kind of joking, but he said, well, what do you mean? And I explained that. This, this lady had severe allergies. It was easy to diagnose. Um, food allergies. But we know she had allergies. I don't know if you, you know that she was supposed to run around with no clothes on. It wasn't prurient. She, she couldn't stand fabric next to her skin. It drove her crazy, and that's quite typical amongst allergy people. So I knew straight away she had allergies. I also know she has food allergies because she used to take a Bloody Mary every morning to get started. And we should be looking at that, too. Food intolerance and allergy often has this addictive element where if you avoid the food, you feel really lousy. And then another dose of the food, and you feel okay again. And that's really what was happening to her. Overnight, she was going into withdrawal symptoms and needed a Bloody Mary to get started. Well, I'm sure it wasn't the tomato juice. It would be probably wheat or corn in the, in the uh, vodka. Vodka traditionally was potato, of course, but... Uh, 30 or 40 years, it's been corn or wheat, not really potato. You can't get potato vodka, but it's rare and very expensive. So I was, you know, that, my point was, if only she'd known me and I'd been able to tell her what I knew, she could have pulled herself off all of these substances and uh, may have survived. She certainly would have had a better life anyway. All right, let's take, let's go forward a little bit now, look at something more serious. Uh, Hardly, uh, hardly in depth yet, but anyway, look at the mechanisms, for example. The first mechanism is the obvious one, what we call food allergy. Now, we used to get in endless arguments. In fact, I used to be on TV and my opposition. I remember one guy, they also trotted him out to come and argue with me. And he used to end up frothing at the mouth. He couldn't bear what I was saying. Uh, did himself a lot of damage. But his idea of food allergy was peanuts or fish. You know, you shellfish, you eat it, you swell up. And you're really bad and it's instant and sometimes you can't breathe. There is no question about that kind of allergy. That's a food allergy. It's very severe. But it's very rare. You know, it's not really the issue. What people like me were finding in the 70s and 80s is that this kind of food reaction was everywhere. If you look for it, knew what to look for, knew how to uncover it. So there is certainly a true food allergy mechanism, but we do go beyond that. For example, even in, you know, even in the 70s and 80s, we were looking at a non, what was clearly non-immunological. There were the basis for a food reaction you could demonstrate. You know, you could, like uh, Susan McWhinney, you took her off wheat, she could talk to you. She eats wheat again, she was a cabbage for a week. So there's no question, it made her ill. So you're not just saying it's not food allergy, there's no such thing. I mean, that, the girl I told you about with cerebral palsy, all the, the overwhelming majority of the media was very favorable, but one, one newspaper chose to attack me and it said, miracle cure exposed as a sham. Now, what did they mean by that? You know, they're trying to imply the girl didn't speak. <laughs> her mum was lying when she said that she spoke to her. Uh, there was a lot of bitterness in those days because they wouldn't accept that if there was no antibodies, then it wasn't an allergy, therefore it didn't exist, therefore it was in the patient's mind, therefore there were hypochondriacs. And the, the things that patients had to suffer in those days were pretty <coughs> extreme. Uh, in fact, a colleague of mine, <coughs> Richard Mackinnis, he wrote a book which was published you published it here as eating dangerously, and it's somewhat the theme of what I'm talking about. Right? But in Britain, it was published as not all in the mind, because people were always being told, it's in your mind. You know, we've done all your blood work, there's nothing wrong. There's the patient sitting with aches and pains and sobbing, and being told there's nothing wrong. I mean, where is the medical value in that? What they meant was, we haven't a clue how to diagnose your problem. That's not the same as nothing wrong. So there's this other phenomenon, whatever it is, and we'll be looking at it. Let's just call it food intolerance. That's how we got around the arguments in the end. We said, well, we'll call it food intolerance. You call it what you like. But we still know that you shouldn't, the person shouldn't eat it. <clears throat> there are other mechanisms, though. The enzyme deficiency, for example. The simplest of these is uh, lactase deficiency, lactase. The enzyme which dissolves lactose, in uh, digests lactose in milk. And if the person lacks lactase, the milk has very unpleasant consequences. It bloats them. They get, they get wind, abdominal pain. Uh, but it's just simply due to the lactose fermenting in the bowel. It's not really an allergy, and if you, they didn't have lactose in their milk, they wouldn't be reacting to milk anyway. Or if you give them a lactose enzyme before they drink it. So that's a, a, a possible source of problems. There are straightforward pharmacological reactions. <clears throat> caffeine is probably the most obvious. I mean, caffeine is a, a toxin. It's got effects on the, the cardiovascular system and so on. You wouldn't really call that an allergy. 
it just does things, and it does it worse to some people than it does to others, but it'll do things to all of us, all of us if we have enough caffeine. And then there's this fascinating phenomenon of genetic variations. We used to say glibly, you know, everybody's different, because that was obvious. But we now know why. This is really only in the last 10 years or so. Since the human genome has been cracked, scientists, and I say we, not me, but scientists who are looking into the genome project have found that they can sequence genes and the different bases that exist that make up the genetic pattern. And sometimes they, the little part, the molecular parts, the moieties, like the uh, sugars and bases that are mixed, have tiny little slips. There are only maybe just one or two things that are out of sequence. It wouldn't be enough to kill the person or stop them functioning, but it might just be enough to make sure that they don't say, say they can't digest tomato properly because of tomatine or something in tomato. So, if you, and there are, you know, thousands, tens of thousands of genes as you know. So if you imagine all these tiny variations, then it becomes very obvious that we're all different and that we can react to things differently and that food, which is just a bunch of chemicals, can go through the same rules as everything else, that a person might be mishandling it. So we no longer really need the immunology model. But, you know, whatever the model is, we, I'm talking about practical clinic, clinical work here. And we used to look at things a different way. Now, clinically, let's go back to the beginning. 1906, uh, an Austrian physician called Clemens von Pierke first tried to define an allergy. And he said it was an acquired, specific, altered capacity for the body to react. And they'll underline the important words. Allergy is generally understood. Uh, first of all, it's acquired. You, you, you know, it's some, you're not born with it. Everybody doesn't have it. A person gets it, but then they need not. It can be acquired. It is specific. You can be allergic to tomatoes, but that doesn't mean you're allergic to everything that's red or everything that's got squishy seeds in the middle. It just means something specific, like a peanut, but other nuts are okay. So it's quite specific. And it's altered. It's not like everybody else has. You know, other people are okay, but some, something is altered about that person's reactivity to it. A good definition had nothing to do with immunology, but then along came in immunology and antibodies and all of a sudden they were saying if it's not that then it's not an allergy and therefore it's a delusion and therefore the patient's a fraud and it was very frustrating for us. But I do want to introduce you to this man. I've got a couple of great favorite American physicians and Arthur Coker is certainly one of them. He's no lightweight as you can see. He was a you know, professor of immunology at Cornell Medical School and he edited the Journal of Immunology so he's a pretty mainstream immunologist and yet he had this awkward habit of saying of course, there's food allergies. They're quite common. In fact, he used to say, um, you don't catch colds, you eat them. Because most of what people call a cold, you know, they get a sniffly nose and they sneeze and some aches and pains. They say, oh, I've got a cold. It isn't. It's something the person ate. You have to just take that on faith for the moment. But I can tell you, 80 or 90% of colds is really a food reaction. And if you find out and eliminate them, you just don't get colds. I mean, I can't remember when I last had a cold, but certainly certainly 10 or 15 years ago, whereas I used to get them every winter. So he, he, he came across this term, or he coined the term familial non reagenic It just meant it runs in families. Uh, there's no humoral mechanism, no antibody chemical base that we know of or we can understand, but there's definitely a reaction. And he was cussed and called it food allergy. Uh, of course, it was very controversial, but I like Arthur Coker because this was back in the 50s and he had the balls to stand up there and say it, even though everybody else was arguing with him. And he wrote a great little book. If you ever come across it, get yourself a copy. It's called The Pulse Test. And one of the simplest ways you can have of figuring out what you might be reacting to as a food, forget the mechanism. It doesn't matter if it's antibodies, uh, genetic variants, chemical, whatever it is, you take your pulse, then eat the food, and your pulse goes up by 10 or more beats. That's a stress or food, and those are the kind of things that we're looking for. And he wrote a book about that. Very, very good little book. My definition of allergy is a lot simpler. <laughs> just something you didn't order. It doesn't matter why, it's, why there's a problem. It's just that there is a problem. So you stay off it. And that's a sort of clinician's working model, if you like, for many years. I, I didn't really care much about the mechanisms and why. What I was interested in is working out how to uncover the mechanisms and how to detect and diagnose it for the patients. Okay, so let's move on a bit. We, we're all used to thinking of food as some nice, friendly, you know, it's nourishing thing, nature, and all that. You put it in your mouth, it nurtures your body, it looks after you. Piffle, a lot of it's poison, and it's serious poison, even though we eat it. Um, some of the uh, 
food families are actually quite toxic, as we'll see. But just a couple of examples, you know, loco weed, uh, loco meaning crazy in Spanish, because bulls that eat loco weed literally go wild and go crazy because of a compound that's, uh, that's contained in that. There are a lot of substances like that, especially in the family called deadly nightshade. Nightshades are the belladonna family, basically. That's the ruling pig. That's called deadly nightshade. And belladonna is very, very poisonous. You probably know that. Do you know how belladonna got its name? It paralyzes the eye and makes the pupil open. So in 18th century Italy, the girls would all put drops of belladonna in their eyes. They get big, beautiful, black, dewy eyes and look gorgeous. So it's called uh, the belladonna, the beautiful lady is what it means in Spanish. Of course, it also spoiled their ability to focus, so they kept bumping into chairs and things. Which was <laughs> but that's how it got its name. <laughs> Uh, carrot has a nerve toxin, which is an organophosphate type, you know, related to nerve gas. You'd have to eat a lot of carrots, but uh, be sure it's there. Some comic said once that if cabbage had to pass the test that drugs go through for safety, it wouldn't pass. There was, and I don't mean pesticides on the cabbage, I mean the cabbage itself. There's a condition called lathyrism. It comes from the lathyrus bean, which is, you know, this closer cousin to the gabonzo bean which causes nerve paralysis. In fact, they have to, it was grown in India. Whenever the crops fell, they all scattered garbanzo beans and, and had to eat them to survive, but they'd end up paralyzed. So the Indian government's tried to ban that particular bean. That's how bad beans can be. I mean, we all know that, don't we? If you, the, the red bean, you know, the kidney bean. If you don't cook it properly, it gives you shocking bellyache. It's quite poisonous until you've inactivated the chemicals with cooking. And favism is a, a favia bean is another kind of bean, the broad bean. And that causes a hemolytic anemia in genetically sensitive people around the Mediterranean. People die of favism, so it can be serious. Oh, we've, sorry, I mentioned, I already mentioned these, haven't I, anyway, no, it's shit. But it's a, it's a big family, it includes, it's a funny and varied family. It includes potatoes, uh, tomatoes, uh, chilies, well, I suppose they're obvious. Uh, tobacco is actually in that family too, the tobacco plant. Eggplant. Uh, yeah, eggplant or aubergine, we call it, yeah. Uh, so, uh, you know, a lot of foods come under that particular banner. There are foods that produce goiters, you know, swell swellings in the thyroid gland. Uh, they're the crucifer family. Uh, they used to be called the, uh, what were they called before? Brassicas. Um, cabbage and kale, that family, are notorious for that. They contain some good things as well. You know, we know indole 3 carbonyl that's supposed to protect against cancer. I think the evidence is good. Uh, but don't forget, they're full of poisons too. I'm not suggesting all foods are all poison. I'm saying almost all foods have poisons in that you need to be aware of. And if your detox pathways aren't working because of some minor genetic variation, that's why it could react badly for you. Okay? There are estrogen mimics in food, we know, and hormonal blocking substances in food too. There are substances that create hypertension. You know, chocolate's notorious for that. Uh, alcohol and cheese are notorious. Less well-known, pineapple juice and avocado. Milk sickness, I don't know if you know this illness, we don't have it in Europe, but it's caused by eating, it's caused by animals eating uh, or grazing on a plant called Eupatorium rugosum. And that contains a chemical called trematone that gives you the shakes or the trembles. If you're unlucky enough to drink milk from a cow that's done that, you get milk sickness. And I think Americans would be interested to know, if you don't know already, that that's probably what killed Abraham Lincoln's mother. She died of milk sickness from toxins in, in the milk that came via plants, okay? <coughs> plants also contain a fascinating and very complex group of compounds called the alkaloids. From the term alkal alkali, you might guess they're alkaline uh, because they have a, a, a nitrogen part in there, an ammonium type molecule in there. That, that confers the alkalinity, <coughs> but also gives all sorts of other funny properties. They're very fascinating. Uh, lots and lots of them. The famous ones, caffeine, nicotine, we've been talking about, quinine, uh, uh, strychnine, which is a strict poison, uh, ergot-like substances that will send the uterus into spasms. And of course, psychedelics, those, those are the fun ones, you know, <laughs> mescaline and peyote and psilocybin and mushrooms, all those things. They're all, they're all plant or fungal alkaloids, highly active chemically, and do all those wonderful things. Personally, I've never taken drugs, I, on my honor, I've never, never once taken any kind of drug. Um, so I don't have first-hand experience on it, but it seems to me that a lot of people had a lot of fun and a lot of people made themselves very sick, but the problem with drugs seems to be the crime that surrounds it rather than the plant itself. I'm sure you'd agree with that. Oh yeah, and opium and 
a coca plant, of course, when people say, oh, herbs, you know, natural, they're all nice and safe and friendly. I say, oh, you mean like hemlock and like opium and <laughs> marijuana? Well, those are plants. <laughs> so don't be fooled. You know, even, even in herbalism, you can be talking serious things, serious stuff. Just to make sure that animals don't get left out, <laughs> here's an example. The puffer fish, or fugu. The Japanese like to eat this. It contains one of the most powerful toxins known. It is so dangerous that if a chef handles the liver of this fish, cuts the liver and then cuts the fish and serves it to a customer, the customer will die, for sure. So they have to be licensed, they have to have special training, and it's a big macho cult thing in Japan. You go out and eat food and then you sit around and see if you're going to die. <laughs> and about 100 people every year do. Okay? So when I, was, I was there once and a guest, of a, a nice chap, he said, anything you really want? And I said, well, this fugu thing, you know, I've never done it. Uh, and he said, sure. So we put the, it was a beautiful big plate like this and everything was thin as a feather. You know, you could see the willow pattern plate through the, through the fish. It would look gorgeous, absolutely tasteless. But anyway, we did it <laughs> and, uh, and didn't die. <laughs> Sometimes they add a tiny bit of poison that makes your lips, and, you know, you feel you can't breathe. Just add, make it more fun. Those are the sort of macho guys, but we didn't do that. Anyway, I was quite, I was actually afterwards quite shocked and a bit humiliated because I found it cost about $600 for a plate of fugu. And I just thought, you know, it's like hamburger and chips. <laughs> uh, but very, very expensive treat, apparently. Okay, I'm going to tell you now some unusual, my, my laws of nutrition, right? These are laws based on a clinician's work over years. They're not like you'll read anywhere else. I'm a professor of nutrition at the Open International University for Complementary Medicines, but I'm a complete wacko and a maverick, right? I don't believe what everybody else is teaching. The first thing I learned is that stuff that you're eating that you shouldn't be eating is doing you a lot more harm than things that you're not having that you should. And that was a big revelation to me in the early 70s. Taking people off foods produced more miracle cures than ever trying to supplement missing ingredients or adding things to the diet. That's how important this message is. And this is why I, write, I wrote the book, Diet Wise. I'm not doing clinical work here and taking patients, but I realized that I was carrying around so much knowledge from 30 years that I should put it in a book, all of it. A layman's book, I mean, the, you know, the, the lab work and the, all the other things didn't go into this book, it's just a practical advice book. Um, the second thing is that, the, as I've already hinted, the incompatible foods are different from everybody. So, you know, we all, we, we, you've got to find out what. There's no, no such thing as a you know, good diet, there's a universal diet, you follow this diet and you'll be okay. Because you can say, you, you and you, you'll be fine, and then somebody somewhere is going to be sick as a dog on the same diet. Because they're, the foods they're allowed to eat, they cannot tolerate. It doesn't matter what you're supposed to be able to eat. That's true for all diets, right? So I, my rules, three and four, are these really. The all published set diets are going to make a percentage of people worse. And so they're not, it's not the way forward. You know, the way forward is rule four, which is to design your own personal, unique diet. I can show you how to figure it out, give you some clues tonight. But you work out what's good for you. And the rewards are that you'll feel a lot better, you'll look at least 10 years younger, if not 15 years younger, feel 15 years younger. That was, I mean, that was my first dabbling into anti-aging medicine back in the 70s. I put patients on a diet. All their friends are saying, you're great, you look 10 years younger, what are you doing? I want to do it. Uh, and that's truly, I think, the number one anti-aging factor is get your diet right. And I'll tell you a special story at the end. What's the, the basis of all this? Well, I want to introduce uh, Hans Silie's stress theory. I, I know a lot of people in this very educated room will know this story, but maybe haven't related it to food. Hans Silie was an Austrian physician. He ended up in Canada, and he brought forth this classic theory of stress, going through various stages of adaptation. Stage one was when you get a stressor and you feel a reaction. He called that the alarm phase. Now let's use it for food. And what we might find is as a child, every time the child drinks milk, he feels sick, he throws up, or gets a rash or looks poorly. That would be the alarm phase. And if parents are sensible, they take the child off milk. But what parents usually do is say, you must eat your milk. Now drink your milk. It's good for you. It's got all that calcium, strong bones and strong teeth. Sometimes they say, you want to grow up like daddy, and the child take a look and say, no, I don't want to grow up like daddy. <laughs> anyway, what happens then is if you keep meeting this stressor, you eventually adapt to it. Your body kind of gets accustomed to it. 
Smokers will know this. How many smoke? Anyone here still smoke? You probably shouldn't raise your hand. Uh, a health lecture auditorium in, in California is the last place to raise your hand, so I'm sorry for that question. Anyway, some of you have smoked, I know, and you remember that when you first did it, you probably went green and wanted to throw up. Why you persisted beyond that point, God knows. <laughs> but people do, they keep at it until they don't feel ill anymore. And this is what Sillier called phase two, or the adaptation phase. You're now adapted. So this kid here has been forced to eat milk and retch eating for the first few months. Now doesn't retch anymore, so everybody's happy. Uh, maybe there's a little rash, but the doctor will say, don't worry, they'll grow out of it by the time they're six or seven years old. And they do, because of this adaptation process. Um, and the, 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 the trouble is, though, although there are no symptoms, it doesn't mean it's suddenly become friendly. And this is what you've got to bear in mind. This is the number one key to what I'm saying tonight, is you can be eating a food for years and years and years, decades, and all the time it's killing you underneath the surface. It's eroding your defenses, it's wearing things down, it's causing ruin and crumbling, but you're not aware of it. Your body copes. It's adapted, remember? but it's adaptation to a stressor. So sooner or later, that adaptation is gonna collapse. So we call that stage maladaptation. You're now no longer adapted. Now if you eat the food, you feel rotten. So this is like a new, a new version of the allergy, if you like. 30 years on, the person is now food allergic again. And the, the reactions can, be, can vary, as we'll see in a minute. But they, it, this is worse. You know, you've run out of options now. When the person, when symptoms re-emerge, it means the defenses have failed, your body can't cope, you're in a much more serious place than in phase one when you had symptoms, right? And I've, I myself have added a fourth, this is not mentioned by Celia, but those of us that worked in this field would all agree that there is this fourth stage, which is the sort of addiction phase in terms of a food allergy or intolerance. It's the phase where the person will eat the food because it relieves the symptoms. So if you're aware of something you like to eat and you feel better when you eat it, look out. It's almost certainly a food that's doing you harm. In Britain, we like tea, as you know. And whenever I hear, and I often hear, somebody say, oh, I love a cup of tea. It just calms me down, soothes my nerves. I know straight away that tea is aggravating the person's nerves and putting them on edge, right? It's like morphine, uh, uh, heroin, those things, you know. They, you feel better when you take the substance but only because it made you feel lousy in the first place. It's relieving the symptoms, or as we said in the trade, as it were, the expression we used was a masked allergy, or a hidden allergy. And that's been the big secret, why all of this wasn't discovered for so many years. Uh, in fact, it only really started to come to light in the 50s and 60s. Uh, there, there are stories earlier than that, but I mean, big time, it came to the surface then. In the 70s, Richard Mackinnis, uh, I mentioned, wrote a famous book, Eating Dangerously Here, Not All in the Mind in Britain. I read that book, and I thought this is either bunk or it's important. So instead of being like my colleagues and saying, it must be bunk, you know, it can't be true, therefore it isn't, you know, that, that very valid scientific principle, <laughs> I thought I'd try it. And I put patients on diets, and wow, it was amazing. Asthma vanished, arthritis disappeared overnight, rashes gone, people looking and feeling terrific. So. You know, I knew he was right, and that, was, that set the rest of my career then. And I had the most wonderful time, made lots of friends. It was, it was, it was no, it wasn't just different, you know. We'd sit down and we'd talk for an hour, two hours sometimes, because I wanted to know what they were doing, what did they eat, how often did they eat it. We became real friends, you know. Anyway, there are two phenomena that make this very complicated and confusing, and why most doctors still resist it and still don't really understand it. The first is the phenomenon called threshold. Now, i put some numbers to this. I want you to know these are arbitrary numbers, but let's play a pretend game. I think it'll be clear. Let's say our threshold here is 10. Can you see here that line? If you score a 10, then you get symptoms. Okay, if you score a 9, you don't feel anything. Nothing at all. You feel fine. But if you hit 10 or 11, then you get a headache or a rash or diarrhea, whatever's going to happen. Well, if you eat a food that scores a 6, of course, nothing's going to happen. You know, it's, it's just not, it's not perfect for you, but it's not so unfriendly, it's going to hurt you. If you have a, either a lot of it or a food that's got a bad score, say a 16, that's going to make you really bad. That's way over the threshold. So that's a food you would probably find out yourself sooner or later. I don't feel good when I eat chocolate. I get a wrong headache and uh, you stop eating chocolate, okay, whatever. But you can also have this, this phenomenon here, 
the summation effect, you know, you have a four, nothing happens. Another food that's a four, still nothing happens. But if in, you know, in the same time frame you eat another food that's, say, a three, that will push you over into symptoms. But you see, those three individual foods are not capable of doing it. Let's say that four at the bottom was bananas, and the next one was beef. So only if you had bananas and beef in the same meal are you going to come anywhere near that threshold. So you test beef, you eat beef, eat loads of beef, nothing happens. They wonder if it's bananas. So you have a three or four bananas next day. Absolutely nothing. It can't be bananas. But that's going to get you confused. Can you see? So if you understand this threshold effect, it will explain a lot of mysteries. That things can appear to react and then not necessarily react. You've got to have some way of sort of quantifying the reaction. And of course, the, the, the last but one column is if you eat them all at once. Same principle applies. If you eat three lousy foods all on the same plate, you're going to feel bad. But it would take all three. You know, the eight wouldn't do it, the eight and the two would do it just, but the six and the two wouldn't do it either. One other little catch, which is the threshold can move. Like I've shown it in the last column, if the threshold drops, let's say the person is under stress, uh, you know, going through a you know, bad marriage relationship or bankruptcy or something, or a viral infection will do it also. Anything that lowers the general resistance, increases the body load, can shift your threshold to the point where that food is suddenly hurting you, and it didn't before. Another confusing phenomenon is what we call the target organ effect, or sometimes called the shock organ or end organ failure. And it really what it's saying is that the symptom, doesn't matter what the food is, the symptom relates to the organ. So if you have a bad intolerance to milk, and you drink milk, if it affects skin, you're going to get a rash. But for somebody else, it will give them migraine. Somebody else might get arthritis. Somebody else gets colitis or diarrhea with milk. And it can also shift around, by the way. It's not fixed. You know, you can have <laughs> you can have a bad eczema part of your life, but that clears up, and then the next thing you've got is asthma, and then that clears up. The next thing you've got is migraine, and then by the time you're 40, that's switched to arthritis. All the same thing, all milk, all the way through, but the target organ has shifted around. So you just see how potentially confusing this can be. This is what took so long for it to really be discovered, and it takes an extraordinary amount of you know, sort of meticulous detailed investigation. You can't go at it half-cocked, but there is one great breakthrough key, which I'll be sharing with you, that leads you through the forest really quite quickly. Uh, because of this threshold effect and the target organ effects, we've got to keep this in mind, which is that the symptoms, they can be extremely bizarre. So a protean means they change. You know, proteus, the great, you could appear to humans in any form. So protean means it has many and changing forms. Proteus was the son of Poseidon, the Greek name, or Neptune is the Latin name, isn't it? Um, it can be extremely subjective, and patients have trouble describing it. Like, you know, hot water running down the inside of my skin, or I feel there's a stone sitting in my abdomen. Or even, you know, weird things like hallucinations, you know, like the walls are moving, or there's fairies in the room, or things like that. Uh, that pass off, I mean, I had a guy with schizophrenia, except he, he wasn't schizophrenic, unless he ate cheese. If he ate cheese, he ended up having, you know, conversations with Jesus Christ and Hitler and all the people who simply were not in the room. And he would talk to them for days until he evacuated the bowel, the last of the cheese disappeared, and he'd wake up absolutely normal again the next day. All he had to do was avoid cheese. So the, 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 uh, the consequences can be extremely complex and varied. But of course this is the last thing that the medical profession wants to hear. They're trained on syndromes sets of symptoms that they can recognize. If that symptom, that symptom, and that symptom occur together, that's such and such a syndrome, we know what that is. But the patient comes up with all these weird complaints that change every week anyway. Uh, what happens? It's obvious what's going to happen. They're going to get past as, as hypochondriacs. They're making it up. They're poor, sad, inadequate people. And they're often told, you know, there's nothing wrong. We've tested you. There's nothing wrong. It's all in your mind. And that was the whole point of Richard McInnes's book title, that people got rather sick of being told that. It's very sad. Um, anyway, so this is my number one symptom that will point to allergy or intolerance of the kind that I'm talking about. It comes and goes quickly. It's there sometimes, then it's not, then it's there again, then it's not. And on the, on the times when it's not, you're fine, okay? So if this is happening to you, it isn't a cancer. You know, the cancer isn't going to disappear one afternoon. 
let you off your symptoms and then reappear next day. If it's degeneration, that's not going to happen. You know, if you have a degenerative disease, it just gets steadily worse. I mean, the symptoms may do this a bit, but they're still doing this and go, you're going downhill all the way. I have a saying for patients, which if you can be, no matter how ill you are, if you can be well on just one day, then you can be perfectly well every day. Think about that. It's just logical, isn't it? Because there's nothing wrong with you. If you have a good day, there's no bits missing, you haven't got any genetic uh, inadequacy or anything like that. Nothing's broken down because you couldn't have had the good day otherwise. So that's very encouraging to people if they have good days but suffer a lot. I used to focus them on the good days and say, let's get this to happen to you every day. Same with infections, you know, they just don't follow that coming and going pattern. There are some symptoms which will point very obviously to this food intolerance, reactive effect. Bloating and flatulence, you know, do you know what bloating means? You know, the stomach comes out like this. I have seen men and women, but particularly women, I've seen them gain six inches in less than five minutes uh, when we're doing a challenge. Uh, food binges, that's another one. Remember I mentioned this, people getting hooked on foods and they just can't stop themselves guzzling the whole bag. Uh, peppermint chocolates over there, was it? <laughs> Can't stop himself. <laughs> um, food cravings. Now, it's interesting when I point out to people that, you know, what happens when you don't eat is not hunger. Right? What you get, the feelings that you get, what you call hunger, are food cravings. How do I know? Well, I've taken lots of people through a fast, and I can tell you by the fifth day of the fast, the person is not hungry and doesn't feel hungry again for the next three weeks. So lack of food is not hunger. Hunger is the craving signal for whatever food it is that you're hooked on and addicted to. And that's a very strong clue. Especially if you're managing kids. You know, you say, well, eat an apple. Oh, I'm not hungry. I don't want an apple. I want a biscuit. So you say, well, uh, you know, the, the answer is they're craving the, you know, the milk or the sugar or the cookie or something. And you just, if you don't let them have the cookie, eventually they'll want the apple. But what they're actually doing is craving certain foods. And the apple won't fulfill the craving, right? They, they, the body knows. I mean, you know, the person doesn't know they're craving corn, starch, so it's there. But the body knows. You know, the body says, I want that food. That's the, that's the only one that's going to work. Uh, another good sign is fluctuating weight. It's a great way to lose weight, by the way, this program. If you get yourself off of these bandit foods that I'm talking about, it's so easy to lose weight, you wouldn't believe. It comes off steadily, just a couple of pounds a week, three pounds a week, maybe. But it's really quite gratifying. But anyone who's got wildly swinging weight, you know, they're up 10 pounds, then they've struggled to get it down, and then it's up a bit, and then it's down. And again, I've seen people gain six pounds in a day eating the wrong food until they knew, you know, what, it was, what was going on and where it was from. <laughs> Obviously, if you're in the middle of a meal and you start to feel sick, that's likely to be the food that you're eating that's causing it. Uh, symptoms that come on immediately after food. One or two people are nodding a bit, and I think it's the cookies. Uh, <laughs> uh, I, when I give uh, after lunch speeches, you can often look around the room and say, there's somebody with a bright red face, they're obviously reacting to lunch, somebody asleep, they're obviously reacting, <laughs> and so on. Uh, I mentioned this addiction thing, so feeling unwell without food, you know, you've gone without food for seven hours and you feel an awful headache coming on. Really strong clue that that's some food that your body is craving. And this one, the last one, this is very satisfying, waking up and feeling lousy in the morning. I don't know how many people admit to that, but it's very common. In fact, it's so common that people consider it normal. Well, it's not normal, but it is common. That, you know, you're crabby and tired, you're irritable. You, you know, we have a saying like, you're feeling like death warmed up. Have you heard that one? Uh, until you've had your fit. Now, why is this? It's because when you come to breakfast time, you've been off food 12, maybe 14 hours, and that's enough to set up withdrawal symptoms. And so the person then is, wants breakfast, they want their Wheaties, or the corn, or the caffeine, or sugar, or milk, or whatever it is they're having at breakfast. That gives them a fix, clears the symptoms, and winds them up, off they go for the day, until next day when they wake up again with withdrawal symptoms. Okay, so how do you approach this? The most totally logical answer, of course, is stop eating. <laughs> if you don't eat, it all clears up. So food, can we, can we all agree with that? Anyone fault the logic there? A bit drastic, and I do not recommend diets for person, uh, fast, sorry, a person can get themselves into a lot of trouble with a fast, and they can find themselves unable to get back on foods, because everything they eat makes them feel really sick. There are problems. A compromise with that is one I christened a half fast. You may have heard of people trying to eat lamb and pears for five days. The hope is that you're not allergic to lamb or pears. If you are, it's not going to work, right? But we, we choose those because they're pretty unusual allergies. And uh, you, you follow that. What, what we're trying to do, you see, is, is clear the foods from the bowel. That's the issue. It takes five days, so no matter what you do, fasting or anything else, 
And you can always say to a person you feel lousy for four days, because that's the withdrawal symptoms. And then on the fifth day, you'll wake up feeling like a new person. And it was like magic. They always rang and said, I feel great. How did you know? It's so predictable, and it rests on clearing the bell. So if the person's constipated, it will take a little longer. But that's all it is. Once the last of the food has gone from the body, all symptoms vanish, and it's like magic. Trust me, it's amazing. A slightly uh, upscale version of that, instead of just two foods and getting bored to death and ruination, is to pick eight exotic foods. Things you, by exotic, it doesn't mean it has to come from Indonesia or something. It means just things you don't normally eat. So if you don't normally eat rabbit, for example, that would, that would do. You don't have to like them. Um, you don't, you know, it doesn't matter really, as long as you pick foods that are... We're trying to choose eight neutral foods. So we pick a couple of starch foods, like buckwheat and or quinoa. Uh, grains which you can boil up and uh, you know, that makes a soft, starchy food. A couple of fruits, again, pick some unusual ones. So I call that the eight foods diet, but best of all, or easiest of all, and what this book is structured around is a sensible exclusion program. What we mean by that is you give up the likely culprits. Now, it's only, this is only gambling, this is just like going to Las Vegas, and it's playing the odds. We choose the foods that it's most likely to be and throw them out and see what happens. And of course, I would say four out of five times the person gets better because those are the usual troublemaker foods. Foods like uh, grains, uh, tea, coffee, uh, dairy produce and so on. And there's a sort of hit list. But obviously a person could react to those. I mean, for example, you're allowed to eat meat on this diet. So if you're allergic to meats, you'd be better following a vegetarian diet than this one. But the way we came by this diet, not we, the way the pioneers came to this diet is by studying what should we eat, what is man's <coughs> real natural diet. And it's basically a hunter-gatherer diet. And we sometimes call it the caveman diet. In fact, in the, in the UK, they used to start calling me the Stone Age doctor because of this diet. And I said, it's not fair, I only have a few strands of grey hair, you know, I'm not that old. <laughs> No, no, we a joke. <laughs> it wasn't a very good joke, was it? But it, it did get into print a few times. But we, were, we the, the caveman diet, or the Stone Age diet, is the Paleolithic diet. You might have heard it as that. Think of a, a family walking through the forest, right? They would uh, gather fruits and roots and berries and things. Occasionally, they'd knock some unlucky animal on the head or catch a fish, and they would drink water, and that was it. That's all you had. And by chance, those happen to be the favourable foods. And, you know, four out of five at least, if not more people, will improve on just cutting back to that diet. The other foods are what I call farmer foods. Dairy produce, cereals. You know, we've only been farmers for 10,000 years, really. That's absolutely a blink of an eye in evolution. We're not adapted to these foods. They are not natural. Whatever propaganda you hear about natural whole wheat, it is completely foreign to us. And, hey, what? Wheat is the number one intolerated, uh, untolerated food. Uh, and then you've got all the funny things like sugar, uh, stimulant drinks like tea and coffee, and then all this modern wonder chemical stuff, burgers and fries and stuff. Uh, so there's no wonder that we don't tolerate those particularly well. But remember, this, this program is not talking about you know, lousy fast foods. I'm talking about real foods, people made ill by real, organically grown wheat, real, organically grown ethylene-free bananas and so on. You know, we used to test them with completely uh, clean chemical food, and the person would still react to the food. They've got nothing to do with food additives, colorings, and flavorings, and so on. That's all a problem, but it's not this problem. It's a different problem, okay? Uh, so, there are three basic outcomes if you do. You do this for about two weeks, okay? You don't do it the rest of your life or anything. This is an investigative diet. It's not the same as your maintenance diet. There are three outcomes. If anyone can find a fourth, please let me know. I can only think of three. <laughs> it's one of these three. You're either better, worse, or the same. If you're better, that's great news. It means something you gave up was causing you trouble. Is that logical? It doesn't tell you what, but the important thing to remember is it's not going to be all of them. So if you've given up a whole bunch of foods, you don't have to say, oh, wow, you know, I can never eat those again now. That's not how it works. You, what you've got to then do is find out which ones were the problem. <coughs> and it may only be one or two or three, and all the rest you can bring back into your diet. Uh, we call that challenge testing. I haven't got time to go into that tonight, but it's uh, you know, part of a chapter on, in the book on the most accurate way that I found of doing challenge testing. Uh, if you feel worse, that's not as disappointing as it sounds. If you change your diet and feel much worse, it's telling you that there is a food, yeah? It's something you're eating more of, though. So on this diet, you might find yourself eating more fruit. That might point to the fact that maybe you're allergic to fruit. Uh, so I'll give you some clues. 
And there are ways to, you know, to work your way around that problem. And, and the last one, even if you just stay the same, you think, oh, well, it wasn't the food. No, it could still be. You could, be, you could have given up two or three foods that were bad, but you're still eating two or three foods that were bad. Sometimes you need to, you need to get them all at once. My, my friend Doris Rapp, who used to live in Buffalo, she's now moved out to the sunshine in Phoenix, bless her. But Doris used to talk about what she called the eight nails in the shoe trap. If you think you have eight nails sticking up in your shoe and you pull out six nails, you're still going to limp. Okay? It's still going to hurt. <laughs> you need to get all eight nails, and then you're comfortable. And it's a bit like that with the diet. So once you've got all the eight nails, then you feel good. Then it's easy to, to identify the culprits. Okay? And as I said, the rewards for doing this are really very great. I would say to anybody who's chronically sick for any reason, you've got to give this a shot. You saw some of the examples, the weird diversity of things that it could be. Some are obvious, you know, like a skin rash. It's almost invariably some kind of allergic reaction. A food is likely to be the problem. Asthma, what do you think about it? It's dust and cat fur, you know? 80%, 85% of the asthma patients I ever dealt with, it was a food. It was something they were eating. And same with rhinitis and sneezing. You know, you think, well, that's got to be something you're breathing. No! Think back to Arthur Coker. He said, you, you know, you, you eat coals. The person eats a banana or something, they're allergic to it, they start sneezing. They never think of it because they haven't read my book, basically. Or haven't been taught the story by, you know, a doctor who doesn't know what, what's going on. So let's go on to, as I said, that's, that's how you approach things. That's a test diet. It's a trial and error period. And you eventually figure out some culprits, okay? And you need to avoid those longer term, not the rest of your life. Uh, for example, this first saying here, something I realized long ago, is that it's what you do every day that does the damage. You know, if you're allergic to dairy, if you have ice cream once every few months, I mean, it's no big deal. And yes, you know, you might feel lousy the next day. I've been at least two inches fatter after eating ice cream last night. Uh, it's, all, it's all gas and wind, because that's what it does to me. Uh, and I, you know, that was just a choice. I thought, I'll have the ice cream, I feel lousy. <laughs> Wish I <they> hadn't. <laughs> uh, but, you know, if I was to eat ice cream every day, I'd probably be dead in six months. You know, it really is quite stressful. My blood pressure goes up, my pulse races. And, uh, you know, if you, you've probably all had this feeling after a meal. You know, you finished a meal and you sit back and you <sighs> and you just feel awful. You know, you know you've overdone it, right? That's food acting as a stressor. And it, they are severe stressors, these foods, trust me. Okay, well, you can't understand all of this without understanding something about food fa families, so I'm just going to tell you that there is such a thing as food families. If you look at them, they're pretty obvious and self-explanatory. It does not mean that if you're bad with one, you're bad with them all. It means if you're bad with one, the others immediately come under great suspicion. And you've got to be careful with them and pick your way amongst it carefully. Some foods are related, like, you know, apple and pear and so on, these are obvious. Some like black pepper, uh, just, it's, all, it's all on its own. It's a you know, unique botanical family, so it's got, not got any relatives. Coffee is such an example. The carrot family, look, carrot, celery, parsnip, parsley, it's all one family. And uh, again, an extreme story, I had a boy <coughs> about 10 years old who had epilepsy, and he was on drugs when he came to me. But it all turned out to be the carrot family. If he ate anything in the carrot family, he had epileptic seizures. If he stayed on that family, he never had a fit since, stopped all his drugs. But quite dangerous for him, so he was doing a lot of harm. And carrots are certainly more dangerous than the drugs. <laughs> so I said, you better stay off the carrots and stay off the epilepsy drugs. It'll be better for you. So you've got this idea. This is, uh, as I said, it's nothing here to learn. It's just understand that foods are grouped. They're similar. You can also group them by chemical compounds that occur in the food what we call phenolic uh, compounds. Uh, nicotine, for example, is a phenolic compound that occurs in food. It turns up in yeast, uh, beef, tomato, potato. It's, it's scattered amongst foods, but it's, just, it's a kind of chemical family rather than a botanical family. So that, you know, there are layers and layers to this, which don't need to concern us with the general picture. Uh, obviously, they can classify animals too. Uh, you know, fowl, a bit fowl breaks up, like uh, duck and uh, pheasant family are different. Our ordinary chicken is in the pheasant family. Um, people ask a lot about egg. Now, egg is one of the most extreme food reactions that we ever see. It's exquisite. Uh, often a person, if they shake hands with somebody who's eaten an egg, they will come out in a rash. If they kiss somebody, they will come out in a rash. Or you cut a cake that was made with egg and then go and cut their egg-free cake because they know it's a problem. They still come out in a rash because there's just enough particles of egg transferred. It's almost unique like that. Egg can be very extreme. And it's no good saying, well, you're allergic to chicken eggs, so you can eat turkey eggs. The usual trouble is a protein called ovalbumin, and it's in pretty well all of them. So you know, if you've got that problem, you, you kind of stuck with it. 
Over and above all these things I'm telling you, you all know the general story, so I'm, I'm running out of time. Um, the obvious things about manufactured food. Some of it gets pasteurized, so it's worthless, you know, it's been heated to the point when there's no nutrient benefits in it. Uh, I'm sure you know this excitotoxin story, you know, aspartame and those food, MSG, all those things that it's, I mean, it's just wreckage that they cause in food with severe consequences that they're trying to cover up because it threatens profits. But you need to be on your guard. Everyone in this room, I expect, knows the high fructose corn syrup story. It is the making of obese America, really, basically. It's highly addictive and it damages liver. You know, you have a lot of trouble with liver disease here. And it isn't really the boozing that goes on here. It's actually the cold, the sodas. You'd be better to drink the alcohol than drink the sodas. And, uh, here, you can have $5 back. Would you feel enriched at that point? <laughs> Don't think so. But that's what they're trying to tell you with vitamin enriched cornflakes and things. <laughs> uh, so th these are the perils of the agriculture business, which themselves are bad news. It's switched. It's not farming anymore. Forget the word farming. Farming doesn't exist in North America. It's called agribusiness now, and it's a very different story. It has nothing to do with raising nutrient foods and selling it to the people. It has everything to do with raising food-shaped garbage and selling it at maximum profit, and it's caveat emptor, it's your own tough titty if you die young, and that's really about what it's come down to. Uh, but there's a, another catch to this, which is repetitive eating of foods, and I want you to know what this is and be on your guard to, for it. You, you eat an extremely monotonous diet without realizing it. If you take wheat, wheat occurs in so many forms in the diet. It's in bread, cakes, biscuits, pastry, pasta, muffins. It even turns up in darn places like ice cream, instant coffee. It is weird, the places that you meet wheat. Now, while we're on the subject of wheat, if you take wheat and yeast, call that bread, right? It's also whiskey. Whiskey, to an allergy doctor like me, is exactly the same as bread. And, uh, you know, if you, if you react to one, in fact, the whiskey is usually the worse form of it. Uh, Ted Randolph, who is the great doyen of this field, uh, he used to say, um, uh, alcohol is jet-propelled food allergy. You know, whatever hits you, it'll hit you ten times as hard if it's in alcohol. And all alcoholic drinks have food ingredients. Uh, in fact, let me, I'll just indulge me a minute, I'll tell you something interesting there. If you take whiskey, for example, as wheat or barley, malt, you know, sprouted grains, uh, vodka is now that way, although it used to be made only with potato. Uh, cane sugar, rum is obviously just cane sugar, that's fairly pure. Wines are good, because those are just grapes, just for men. You know, I'm on record with the BBC as saying, what's your problem? Wine is just the champagne I was talking about. So champagne is just a whole food. There's nothing in the bottle but grapes and bubbles. Uh, and so that's a relatively healthy food. Dry white wine and dry champagne is well tolerated for people even with food reactions. But you start getting onto beers and spirits and it's complicated. Somebody with a wheat allergy, I mean for example wheat allergy and an arthritic would say off wheat for five days, they would like this and they say right, double scotch and tell me what happens, ring me and tell me what happens. The person will usually ring and say it's put them in bed for two days. They have a severe wheat reaction uh, if they take it in the form of whiskey. So you never thought of bread and whiskey being the same, did you? But actually it is, uh, very interesting to know that. I'm not gonna go into GM foods, that's politics really. Um, and also, you know, the, you know, the worries about monoclonal foods. That, I mean, they're really struggling now to preserve foods, food variety. They're trying to store seeds. And I read a story last week, I think that somewhere they'd lost a bee, a disastrous flood had cost them hundreds of thousands of seeds that are being stored. You know what's gonna happen? We're gonna end up with so few plants, like the Irish, they all depended on one plant, the potato. And when the potato blight struck, they died in millions. And the, the danger with any food stuff like that is if you lose the, the diversity, is that when a disease strikes, you lose your main crop and everybody's gonna starve. It's, it's a serious worry to somebody who understands the risk, and not enough people understand the risk, I don't think. Okay, so a couple of, uh, am I okay for a few more minutes? Uh, just a couple of uh, other ways of looking at nutrition. We've got, First of, we've got about five more minutes of talking time and then maybe 10 minutes of Q&A. Oh, okay. Only 10 minutes of Q&A? I thought they were gonna tear me apart this evening. Well, uh, we're ready. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Out with the knives. <laughs> uh, let's, let's make this, I mean, this is just a broad look. I, I did a talk, what's called the bullet points of nutrition. It was like this kind of thing. The bigger picture, you know, you can't do nutrition with what I call account, you know, nutrient accountancy. You know, 15 milligrams of that, 60 milligrams of that. And it, 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 all these things work together, they interact. That's nature's way of doing things. And uh, remember also that what's swallowed doesn't equal nutrition anyway. <laughs> 
because a lot of people don't absorb properly. There's another whole range of project uh, problems that we meet that I've covered it in the book, at least in some depth, you know, that uh, people with malabsorption and intestinal flora disturbance, they don't absorb their food anyway, so it doesn't really matter what they're eating, they may not be getting the benefit of it. And in this society at this time, digestive unwellness is really the norm. It's not by any means unusual. One of the big problems is yeasts. We have so many fermented and yeasty foods. It lives down there in the dark. It's washed by with lovely sugary foods every day. It's absolute yeast heaven down there. And uh, not surprising when we all suffer from dysbiosis and yeast overgrowth. Candid is only just part of it, really. Uh, finally, anyway, there's just a chance to mention this uh, phenomenon that I've alluded to that we understand now that genetics is a much bigger part than we thought. The clinical picture I've just painted for you is the same. Okay? It doesn't matter what the cause is, the same thing obtains. You avoid the food, you feel better. But it, the whole science now is coming together. It's only a few years old, this word, I think, is less than 10 years old, nutrigenomics, nutritional genomics. Uh, it's all since we've discovered you know, the, the structure of the genome, basically. We know it's more than just genes now, because there's only 25,000 genes. You couldn't possibly make a human out of 25,000 genes. And scientists haven't got it right yet. They have this extraordinary arrogance, and they've, they've called the bits that they don't understand junk DNA, as implying that nature's a fool and doesn't know what she's doing, and there's got all this rubbish in the DNA chain. I'm sure it's just that they haven't understood what it is yet. And when we do, I'm sure we're in for some shocking surprises. But these minor variations, single uh, nucleotide polymorphisms, they're called, or SNPs, or SNPs, call them SNPs, uh, can be just a small shift in sequencing like that, like adenosine there instead of cytosine. Um, that changes the whole picture. They, the protein that expresses from that little sequence, or an enzyme, if it's an enzyme especially, could be a minor disaster, and it could be a passport to the person to have an almost lethal reaction to a food that nobody else would have. And it's very fascinating, it's ongoing, it's very complex. I mean, there are thousands of things that you can test. You can have a panel even now. You can go out, instead of going to see an allergy doctor like I was, you can go and see somebody who says, well, I'll do a, we'll do a food SNPs panel. But unfortunately, it costs thousands of dollars. It's still very expensive technology. But it's getting better all the time. The hit rate's getting more accurate all the time. And this is the future, really, this is where we're going. But the good news is, even if you didn't know nutritional genomics, is that you can actually switch off bad genes and switch on good genes by what you eat. If you do exactly what I've been telling you, and you find out and get rid of these stressor foods, it's amazing how things calm down metabolically and functionally inside the body. And you could have very bad genes that will switch off. There's a case I told in the book of a child with muscular dystrophy. It's a completely genetic disease, okay? He, was, uh, he had the Duchenne dystrophy, and it's, it's relentlessly fatal up to about 12 years. It appears at about six. The first thing you notice is the child can't stand up on their legs. They push themselves up on their hands. And this child was suffering. Anyway, the parents brought, them, brought him to me and said, could, could you help? And I said, I don't know. I mean, it was extraordinarily arrogant. I think let's give it a go. Uh, there's no way it could happen. But anyway, I thought, we'll try it. And lo and behold, uh, you know, again, he became a media story because we ended up after that, uh, of uh, him being filmed jogging along beside his friend on a bicycle, and he was uh, in Scotland, he climbed the Scott Memorial on Princess Street, it's that big sort of uh, iconic tower on the main street of Scotland, it's 360 feet high. He climbed to the top, and he couldn't climb stairs, he couldn't even climb one stair when he came to me. So even I'm the first to admit that cannot happen, shouldn't have happened, but it did happen, right? And now we've got some understanding of what's happening. We, we switched off even uh, an autosomal um, dominant gene, um, just, by, just by changing his diet, that's all I did. And, uh, you know, he, I, I don't know if he's still alive now, I lost touch with the family long ago, but he certainly was in fit, in fit and good shape when he was 12. Long enough, most of them dead by then. So, we, I'm serious when I say we can switch off bad, even fatal disease. Yeah, genes. Unfortunately, you can also switch on bad genes by doing the wrong thing. So the other side of the story is equally damaging and true. All this is called regulation of the epigenome. You know the genome is the sequence of genes, okay? Epigenomics means what's going on around that. Not necessarily in the genes, but the implications of it for the nearby processes and the chemicals. Epi, epigenetics, or epigenome, uh, is a, a functional term that we use now. And it's called regulation, but I think we should probably drop the term food allergy and call it uh, epigenetic dysregulation. <laughs> It's just that I'm not into big scientific... You know, doctors love all these big Greek and Latin words, don't they? They will never say the skin is red 
when they can say it's erythematous. <laughs> it means exactly the same thing, but it sounds so much more scientific, doesn't it? Um, okay, so if, if, if you can get around this, this, this regulation which he was talking about, it brings in a lot of stories now. All the books you've read, all the stories you've heard, why if you're eating the right things and de-stressing your body, why things come together and cancer can be stopped in its tracks, your aging slows down, heart disease won't appear when it should on schedule. You can do wonderful things if you choose the right diet, but I've got to give you this one final message, which is forget any set diet book. I don't care how many good stories they've got, but the number of people that look terrific on their diet and how much they spend uh, you know, on, on diet programs and things like that, you forget that, because all that matters to you is not the Periconi diet, the South Beach diet, the Atkins diet, uh, what matters to you is like the Chris's diet, right? Chris's diet is different to everybody else in the room. Mine is different to everybody else in the room. You need to know what it is. And the penalties, uh, sorry, the rewards for doing that are very great. Just quickly, this is a man, an, old, uh, an, an Italian nobleman called Luigi Cornaro. And he was a contemporary of Michelangelo and uh, Leonardo da Vinci. He was like most Italian noble, a noblemen of the day. He had far too much money and not enough sense. He, was drinking and whoring and overeating to the point where he nearly died. And uh, he came to his senses, to a long story short, he said, I'm not enough of that. <laughs> and he did exactly what I've just described to you. This is in the 15th century. He, he, didn't call, he didn't know what food allergies were, he called them rough foods. And he worked out his rough foods. How long did he live? Uh, that's the best part of the story, okay? <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> he, that was at 40, okay? He was nearly dead at 40. And he changed his diet, and he just went on living. He was 50, and he passed 60, then he passed 70, and he passed 80. At 85, he wrote his first book. At 88, he wrote his second book. At 93, he wrote his third book, and at 96, he wrote his, wrote his fourth book. He, sh he died two years short of the century, which is kind of a tragedy, but it isn't really. You know, nature is not just about numbers. That's a mind-made number. Listen, this was in the days when most people didn't make it past 40. It was very, very rare to get your three score years and 10. He made it to 98. So all he, all he was doing is what I'm telling you to do. Figure out what's good for you and stick to that and don't worry about what anybody else is saying. Thank you very much.